Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. In honor of Halloween and the spooky season, This evening, we're reading one of the original works about the Salem Witch Trials from one of the participants. Tonight's book is The Wonders of the Invisible World, being an account of the trials of several witches lately executed in New England by the Reverend Cotton Mather, Doctor of Divinity to which is added a farther account of the trials of the New England witches by the Reverend Increase Mather, Doctor of Divinity and President of Harvard College, first published in 1693 and later revised in 1862, published by John Russell Smith, Soho Square, London. Let's begin. Introduction The two very rare works reprinted in the present volume, written by two of the most celebrated of the early American divines, relate to one of the most extraordinary cases of popular delusion that modern times have witnessed. It was a delusion, moreover, to which men of learning and piety lent themselves, and thus became the means of increasing it. The scene of this affair was the puritanical colony of New England, since better known as Massachusetts, the colonists of which appear to have carried with them in an exaggerated form the superstitious feelings with regard to witchcraft which then prevailed in the mother country. In the spring of 1692, an alarm of witchcraft was raised in the family of the minister of Salem, and some black servants were charged with the supposed crime. Once started, the alarm spread rapidly, and in a very short time, a great number of people fell under suspicion and many were thrown into prison on very frivolous grounds, supported as such charges usually were by very unworthy witnesses. The new governor of the colony, Sir William Phipps, arrived from England in the middle of May, and he seems to have been carried away by the excitement and authorized judicial prosecutions. The trials began at the commencement of June, and the first victim, a woman named Bridget Bishop, was hanged. Governor Phipps, embarrassed by this extraordinary state of things, called in the assistance of the clergy of Boston. There was at this time in Boston a distinguished family of puritanical ministers of the name of Mather. Richard Mather, an English nonconformist divine, had emigrated to America in 1636 and settled at Dorchester, where in 1639 he had a son born, who was named in accordance with the peculiar nomenclature of the Puritans, Increase Mather. This son distinguished himself much by his acquirements as a scholar and a theologian, became established as a minister in Boston, and in 1685 was elected president of Harvard College. His son, born at Boston in 1663 and called from the name of his mother's family, Cotton Mather, became more remarkable than his father for his scholarship, gained also a distinguished position in Harvard College, and was also, at the time of which we are speaking, a minister of the gospel in Boston. 
Cotton Mather had adopted all the most extreme notions of the puritanical party with regard to witchcraft, and he had recently had an opportunity of displaying them. In the summer of the year 1688, the children of a mason of Boston named John Goodwin were suddenly seized with fits and strange afflictions, which were at once ascribed to witchcraft, and an Irish washerwoman named Glover, employed by the family, was suspected of being the witch. Cotton Mather was called in to witness the sufferings of Goodwin's children, and he took home with him one of them, a little girl, who had first displayed these symptoms in order to examine her with more care. The result was that the Irish woman was brought to a trial, found guilty, and hanged, and Cotton Mather published next year an account of the case under the title of Late Memorable Providences Relating to Witchcraft and Possession, which displays a very extraordinary amount of credulity and an equally great want of anything like sound judgment. This work, no doubt, spread the alarm of witchcraft through the whole colony and had some influence on the events which followed. It may be supposed that the panic which had now arisen in Salem was not likely to be appeased by the interference of Cotton Mather and his father. The execution of the washerwoman Bridget Bishop had greatly increased the excitement, and people in a more respectable position began to be accused. On the 19th of July, five more persons were executed, and five more experienced the same fate on the 19th of August. Among the latter was Mr. George Burroughs, a minister of the gospel whose principal crime appears to have been a disbelief in witchcraft itself. His fate excited considerable sympathy, which, however, was checked by Cotton Mather, who was present at the place of execution on horseback and addressed the crowd, assuring them that Burroughs was an impostor. Many people, however, had now become alarmed at the proceedings of the prosecutors, and among those executed with Burroughs was a man named John Willard, who had been employed to arrest the persons charged by the accusers, and who had been accused himself, because, from conscientious motives, he refused to arrest any more. He attempted to save himself by flight, but he was pursued and overtaken. Eight more of the unfortunate victims of this delusion were hanged on the 22nd of September, making in all 19 who had thus suffered, besides one who, in accordance with the old criminal law practice, had been pressed to death for refusing to plead. The excitement had indeed risen to such a pitch that two dogs accused of witchcraft were put to death. A certain degree of reaction, however, appeared to be taking place, and the magistrates who had conducted the proceedings began to be alarmed and to have some doubts of the wisdom of their proceedings. Cotton Mather was called upon by the governor to employ his pen in justifying what had been done, and the result was the book which stands first in the present volume, The Wonders of the Invisible World, in which the author gives an account of seven of the trials at Salem, compares the doings of the witches in New England with those in other parts of the world, and adds an elaborate dissertation on witchcraft in general. This book was published at Boston, Massachusetts in the month of October, 1692. Other circumstances, however, contributed to throw discredit on the proceedings of the court, though the witch mania was at the time spreading throughout the whole colony. 
in this same month of October, the wife of Mr. Hale, Minister of Beverly, was accused. Although no person of sense and respectability had the slightest doubt of her innocence, and her husband had been a zealous promoter of the prosecutions. This accusation brought a new light on the mind of Mr. Hale, who became convinced of the injustice in which he had been made an accomplice. But the other ministers who took the lead in the proceedings were less willing to believe in their own error, and equally convinced of the innocence of Mrs. Hale, they raised a question of conscience, whether the devil could not assume the shape of an innocent and pious person as well as of a wicked person for the purpose of afflicting his victims. The assistance of Increase Mather, the president or principal of Harvard College, was now called in, and he published the book which is also reprinted in the present volume a further account of the trials of the New England witches, to which is added cases of conscience concerning witchcrafts and evil spirits personating men. It will be seen that the greater part of the cases of conscience is given to the discussion of the question just alluded to, which Increase Mather unhesitatingly decides in the affirmative. The scene of agitation was now removed from Salem to Andover, where a great number of persons were accused of witchcraft and thrown into prison, until a justice of the peace named Bradstreet, to whom the accusers applied for warrants, refused to grant any more. Hereupon they cried out upon Bradstreet, and declared that he had killed nine persons by means of witchcraft, and he was so much alarmed that he fled from the place. The accusers aimed at people in higher positions of society, until at last they had the audacity to cry out upon the lady of Governor Phipps himself, and thus lost whatever countenance he had given to their proceedings out of respect to the two Mathers. Other people of character, when they were attacked by the accusers, took energetic measures in self-defense. A gentleman of Boston, when cried out upon, obtained a writ of arrest against his accusers on a charge of defamation and laid the damages at a thousand pounds. The accusers themselves now took fright, and many who had made confessions retracted them, while the accusations themselves fell into discredit. When Governor Phipps was recalled in April 1693 and left for England, the witchcraft agitation had nearly subsided, and people in general had become convinced of their error and lamented it. But Cotton Mather and his father persisted obstinately in the opinions they had published, and looked upon the reactionary feeling as a triumph of Satan and his kingdom. In the course of the year, they had an opportunity of reasserting their belief in the doings of the witches of Salem. A girl of Boston named Margaret Rule was seized with convulsions, in the course of which she pretended to see the shapes or specters of people exactly as they were alleged to have been seen by the witch accusers at Salem and Andover. This occurred on the 10th of September, 1693, and she was immediately visited by Cotton Mather, who examined her and declared his conviction of the truth of her statements. Had it depended only upon him, a new and no doubt equally bitter persecution of witches would have been raised in Boston. But an influential merchant of that town, named Robert Califf, took the matter up in a different spirit, and also examined Margaret Rule 
and satisfied himself that the whole was a delusion or imposture. Caliph wrote a rational account of the events of these two years, 1692 and 1693, exposing the delusion and controverting the opinions of the two Mathers on the subject of witchcraft, which was published under the title of More Wonders of the Invisible World, or The Wonders of the Invisible World Displayed in Five Parts, an account of the sufferings of Margaret Rule collected by Robert Califf, merchant of Boston in New England. The partisans of the Mathers displayed their hostility to this book by publicly burning it, and the Mathers themselves kept up the feeling so strongly that years afterwards, when Samuel Mather, the son of Cotton, wrote his father's life, he says sneeringly of Caliph, quote, There was a certain disbeliever in witchcraft who wrote against the wonders of the invisible world. But as the man is dead, his book died long before him. End quote. Caliph died in 1720. The witchcraft delusion had, however, been sufficiently dispelled to prevent the recurrence of any other such persecutions, and those who still insisted on their truth were restrained to the comparatively harmless publication and defense of their opinions. The people of Salem were humbled and repentant. They deserted their minister, Mr. Paris, with whom the persecution had begun and were not satisfied until they had driven him away from the place. Their remorse continued through several years, and most of the people concerned in the judicial proceedings proclaimed their regret. The jurors signed a paper expressing their repentance and pleading that they had labored under a delusion. What ought to have been considered still more conclusive, many of those who had confessed themselves witches and had been instrumental in accusing others, retracted all they had said and confessed that they had acted under the influence of terror. Yet the vanity of superior intelligence and knowledge was so great in the two Mathers that they resisted all conviction in his Magnalia, an ecclesiastical history of New England, published in 1700, Cotton Mather repeats his original view of the doings of Satan in Salem, showing no regret for the part he had taken in this affair and making no retraction of any of his opinions. Still later in 1723, he repeats them again in the same strain in the chapter of the Remarkables of his father entitled Troubles from the Invisible World. His father, Increase Mather, had died in that same year at an advanced age, being in his 85th year. Cotton Mather died on the 13th of February, 1728. Whatever we may think of the credulity of these two ecclesiastics, there can be no ground for charging them with acting otherwise than conscientiously, and they had claims on the gratitude of their countrymen sufficient to overbalance their error of judgment on this occasion. Their books relating to the terrible witchcraft delusion at Salem have now become very rare in the original editions, and their interest as remarkable monuments of the history of superstition make them well worthy of a reprint. The Wonders of the Invisible World Being an account of the trials of several witches lately executed in New England, and of several remarkable curiosities therein occurring, together with one, observations upon the nature, the number, 
and the operations of the devils. Two, a short narrative of a late outrage committed by a knot of witches in Swedeland, very much resembling and so far explaining that under which New England has labored. Three, some counsels directed a due improvement of the terrible things lately done by the unusual and amazing range of evil spirits in New England. And four, a brief discourse upon those temptations which are the more ordinary devices of Satan by Cotton Mather, published by the special command of His Excellency, the Governor of the Province of the Massachusetts Bay in New England, printed first at Boston in New England, and reprinted at London for John Dunton at the Raven in the Poultry, 1693. The Author's Defense Tis as I remember the learned Scribonius who reports that one of his acquaintance, devoutly making his prayers on the behalf of a person molested by evil spirits, received from those evil spirits a horrible blow over the face. And I may myself expect not few or small buffetings from evil spirits, for the endeavors wherewith I am now going to encounter them. I am far from insensible that at this extraordinary time of the devils coming down in great wrath upon us, there are too many tongues and hearts thereby set on fire of hell. That the various opinions about the witchcrafts which at later time have troubled us are maintained by some with so much cloudy fury as if they could never be sufficiently stated unless written in the liquor wherewith witches use to write their covenants. And that he who becomes an author at such a time had need be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear. The unaccountable frowardness, asperity, untreatableness, and inconsistency of many persons every day gives a visible exposition of that passage. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. There met him two possessed with devils exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. To send abroad a book among such readers were a very unadvised thing, if a man had not such reasons to give as I can bring for such an undertaking. Briefly, I hope it cannot be said, they are all so. No, I hope the body of this people are yet in such a temper as to be capable of applying their thoughts to make a right use of the stupendous and prodigious things that are happening among us. And because I was concerned, when I saw that no abler hand omitted any essays to engage the minds of this people in such holy, pious, fruitful improvements as God would have to be made of his amazing dispensations now upon us. Therefore it is that one of the least among the children of New England has here done what is done. None but the father who sees in secret knows the heartbreaking exercises wherewith I have composed what is now going to be exposed, lest I should in any one thing miss up doing my designed service for his glory and for his people. But I am now somewhat comfortably assured of his favorable acceptance, and I will not fear what can a Satan do unto me. Having performed something of what God required 
in laboring to suit his words unto his works, had this day among us, and therewithal handled a theme that has been sometimes counted not unworthy the pen, even of a king, it will easily be perceived that some subordinate ends have been considered in these endeavors. I have indeed set myself to countermine the whole plot of the devil against New England, in every branch of it, as far as one of my darkness can comprehend such a work of darkness. I may add, that I have herein also aimed at the information and satisfaction of good men in another country, a thousand leagues off, where I have, it may be, more or however more considerable friends than in my own. And I do what I can to have that country now, as well as always, in the best terms with my own. But while I am doing these things, I have been driven a little to do something likewise for myself. I mean, by taking off the false reports and hard censures about my opinion in these matters, the parter's portions which my pursuit of peace has procured me among the keen. My hitherto unvaried thoughts are here published and I believe they will be owned by most of the ministers of God in these colonies. Nor can amends be well made me for the wrong done me by other sorts of representations. In fine, for the dogmatical part of my discourse I want no defense. For the historical part of it I have a very great one the Lieutenant Governor of New England having perused it, has done me the honor of giving me a shield, under the umbrage whereof I now dare to walk abroad. Reverend and dear sir, you very much gratified me, as well as put a kind respect upon me when you put into my hands your elaborate and most seasonable discourse entitled The Wonders of the Invisible World. And having now perused so fruitful and happy a composure upon such a subject at this juncture of time, and considering the place that I hold in the court of Oye and Termine, still laboring and proceeding in the trial of the persons accused and convicted for witchcraft, I find that I am more nearly and highly concerned than as a mere ordinary reader, to express my obligation and thankfulness to you for so great pains, and cannot but hold myself many ways bound even to the utmost of what is proper for me in my present public capacity to declare my singular approbation thereof. Such is your design, most plainly expressed throughout the whole. Such your zeal for God, your enmity to Satan and his kingdom, your faithfulness and compassion to this poor people, such the vigor but yet great temper of your spirit, such your instruction and counsel, your care of truth, your wisdom and dexterity in allaying and moderating that among us which needs it, such your clear discerning of divine providence and periods, now running on apace toward their glorious issues in the world. And finally, such your good news of the shortness of the devil's time that all good men must needs desire, the making of this your discourse public to the world, and will greatly rejoice that the Spirit of the Lord has thus enabled you to lift up a standard against the infernal enemy that hath been coming in like a flood upon us. 
I do therefore make it my particular and earnest request unto you, that as soon as may be, you will commit the same unto the press accordingly. I am your assured friend, William Stoughton. Enchantments Encountered Section 1 It was as long ago as the year 1637 that a faithful minister of the Church of England whose name was Mr. Edward Simons did in a sermon afterwards printed thus express himself quote, at New England now the sun of comfort begins to appear and the glorious day star to show itself said venient and secularis seris there will come times in after ages when the clouds will overshadow and darken the sky there. Many now promise to themselves nothing but successive happiness there, which for a time through God's mercy they may enjoy. And I pray God they may a long time. But in this world, there is no happiness perpetual." End quote an observation, or I had almost said an inspiration, very dismally now verified upon us. It has been affirmed by some who best knew New England that the world will do New England a great piece of injustice if it acknowledged not a measure of religion, loyalty, honesty, and industry in the people there beyond what is to be found with any other people for the number of them. When I did a few years ago publish a book which mentioned a few memorable witchcrafts committed in this country, the excellent Baxter graced the second edition of that book with a kind preface, wherein he sees cause to say, if any are scandalized, that New England a place of as serious piety as any I can hear of under heaven should be troubled so much with witches, I think tis no wonder. Where will the devil show most malice, but where he is hated and hateth most? And I hope the country will still deserve and answer the charity so expressed by that reverend man of God. Whosoever travels over this wilderness will see it richly bespangled with evangelical churches, whose pastors are holy, able, and painful overseers of their flocks, lively preachers, and virtuous livers, and such as in their several neighborly associations have had their meetings whereat ecclesiastical matters of common concernment are considered, churches whose communicants have been seriously examined about their experiences of regeneration, as well as about their knowledge and belief and blameless conversation before their admission to the sacred communion. Although others of less but hopeful attainments in Christianity are not ordinarily denied baptism for themselves and theirs, churches which are shy of using anything in the worship of God for which they cannot see a warrant of God, but with whom yet the names of Congregational, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, or Antipodo-Baptist are swallowed up in that of Christian. Persons of all those persuasions being taken into our fellowship when visible goodliness has recommended them. Churches which usually do within themselves manage their own discipline under the conduct of their elders, but yet call in the help of synods upon emergencies or grievances. Churches, lastly, wherein multitudes are growing ripe for heaven every day, 
and as fast as these are taken off, others are daily rising up. And by the presence and power of the divine institutions thus maintained in the country, we are still so happy that I suppose there is no land in the universe more free from the debauching and the debasing vices of ungodliness. The body of the people are hitherto so disposed that swearing, Sabbath-breaking, whoring, drunkenness, and the like do not make a gentleman but a monster or a goblin in the vulgar estimation. All this notwithstanding, we must humbly confess to our God that we are miserably degenerated from the first love of our predecessors. However we boast ourselves a little, when men would go to trample upon us, and we venture to say, wherein soever any is bold, we speak foolishly, we are bold also. The first planters of these colonies were a chosen generation of men, who were first so pure as to disrelish many things which they thought wanted reformation elsewhere, and yet withal so peaceable that they embraced a voluntary exile in a squalid, horrid American desert rather than to live in contentions with their brethren. Those good men imagined that they should leave their posterity in a place where they should never see the inroads of profanity or superstition. And a famous person returning hence could in a sermon before the parliament profess, I have now been seven years in a country where I never saw one man drunk, or heard one oath sworn, or beheld one beggar in the streets all the while. Such great persons as Budaeus and others, who mistook Sir Thomas More's utopia for a country really existent, and stirred up some divines charitably to undertake a voyage thither, might now have certainly found a truth in their mistake. New England was a true utopia. But alas, the children and servants of those old planters must needs afford many degenerate plants, and there is now risen up a number of people otherwise inclined than our Joshua's and the elders that outlived them. Those two things, our holy progenitors, and our happy advantages make omissions of duty, and such spiritual disorders as the whole world abroad is overwhelmed with, to be as provoking in us as the most flagitious wickedness committed in other places. And the ministers of God are accordingly severe in their testimonies. But in short, those interests of the gospel, which were the errand of our fathers into these ends of the earth, have been too much neglected and postponed, and the attainments of a handsome education have been too much undervalued by multitudes that have not fallen into exorbitances of wickedness. And some, especially of our young ones, when they have got abroad from under the restraints here laid upon them, have become extravagantly and abominably vicious. Hence tis that the happiness of New England has been but for a time, as it was foretold, and not for a long time, as has been desired for us. A variety of calamity has long followed this plantation, and we have all the reason imaginable to ascribe it under the rebuke of heaven upon us for our manifold apostasies. We make no right use of our disasters. If we do not remember whence we are fallen and repent and do the first works, 
and yet our afflictions may come under a further consideration with us. There is a further cause of our afflictions, whose due must be given him. Tis necessary that we unite in everything, but there are especially two things wherein our union must carry us along together. We are to unite in our endeavors to deliver our distressed neighbors from the horrible annoyances and molestations with which a dreadful witchcraft is now persecuting them. To have a hand in anything that may stifle or obstruct a regular detection of that witchcraft is what we may well with a holy fear avoid. Their Majesty's good subjects must not every day be torn to pieces by horrid witches, and those bloody felons be left wholly unprosecuted. The witchcraft is a business that will not be shamed without plunging us into sore plagues and of long continuance. But then we are to unite in such methods for this deliverance as may be unquestionably safe, lest the latter end be worse than the beginning. And here, what shall I say? I will venture to say thus much, that we are safe when we make just as much use of all advice from the invisible world as God sends it for. It is a safe principle that when God Almighty permits any spirits from the unseen regions to visit us with surprising information, there is then something to be inquired after. We are then to inquire of one another what cause there is for such things. The peculiar government of God over the unbodied intelligences is a sufficient foundation for this principle. When there has been a murder committed, an apparition of the slain party accusing of any man, although such apparitions have oftener spoke true than false, is not enough to convict the man as guilty of that murder. But yet it is a sufficient occasion for magistrates to make a particular inquiry whether such a man have afforded any ground for such an accusation. Even so, a spectre exactly resembling such or such a person, when the neighborhood are tormented by such spectres, may reasonably make magistrates inquisitive whether the person so represented have done or said anything that may argue their confederacy with evil spirits although it may be defective enough in point of conviction. Especially at a time when tis possible some overpowerful conjurer may have got the skill of thus exhibiting the shapes of all sorts of persons on purpose to stop the prosecution of the wretches whom due inquiries thus provoked might have made obnoxious unto justice. Query whether if God would have us to proceed any further than bare inquiry, upon what reports there may come against any man from the world of spirits. He will not by his providence at the same time have brought into our hands these more evident and sensible things, whereupon a man is to be esteemed a criminal. But I will venture to say this further that it will be safe to account the names as well as the lives of our neighbors, two considerable things to be brought under a judicial process, until it be found by humane observations that the peace of mankind is thereby disturbed. We are humane creatures, and we are safe while we say they must be humane witnesses who also have in the particular act of seeing or hearing which enables them to be witnesses, had no more than humane assistances, 
that are to turn the scale when laws are to be executed. And upon this head I will further add, a wise and a just magistrate may so far give way to a common stream of dissatisfaction as to forbear acting up to the height of his own persuasion about what may be judged convictive of a crime, whose nature shall be so abstruse and obscure as to raise much disputation. Though he may not do what he would leave undone, yet he may leave undone something that else he could do when the public safety makes an exigency. I was going to make one venture more, that is, to offer some safe rules for the finding out of the witches, which are at this day our accursed troublers. But this were a venture too presumptuous and Icarian for me to make. I leave that unto those excellent and judicious persons with whom I am not worthy to be numbered. All that I shall do shall be to lay before my readers a brief synopsis of what has been written on that subject by a triumvirate of as eminent persons as has ever handled it. I will begin with an abstract of Mr. Perkins's way for the discovery of witches. 1. There are presumptions which do at least probably and conjecturally note one to be a witch. These give occasion to examine, yet they are no sufficient causes of conviction. 2. If any man or woman be notoriously defamed for a witch, this yields a strong suspicion. Yet the judge ought carefully to look that the report be made by men of honesty and credit. 3. If a fellow witch or magician give testimony of any person to be a witch, this indeed is not sufficient for condemnation, but it is a fit presumption to cause a straight examination. 4. If after cursing there follow death, or at least some mischief, for witches are wont to practice their mischievous facts by cursing and banning, this also is a sufficient matter of examination, though not of conviction. 5. If after enmity, quarreling, or threatening, a present mischief does follow, that also is a great presumption. 6. If the party suspected be the son or daughter, the manservant or maidservant, the familiar friend, near neighbor or old companion of a known and convicted witch, this may be likewise a presumption for witchcraft is an art that may be learned and conveyed from man to man. 7. Some add this for a presumption. If the party suspected be found to have the devil's mark, for it is commonly thought when the devil makes his covenant with them, he always leaves his mark behind them, whereby he knows them for his own, a mark whereof no evident reason in nature can be given. 8. Lastly, if the party examined be unconstant or contrary to himself in his deliberate answers, it argueth a guilty conscience which stops the freedom of utterance. And yet there are causes of astonishment which may befall the good as well as the bad. 9. But then there is a conviction, discovering the witch, which must proceed from just and sufficient proofs, and not from bare presumptions. 10. 
scratching of the suspected party and recovery thereupon, with several other such weak proofs, as also the fleeing of the suspected party thrown upon the water. These proofs are so far from being sufficient that some of them are, after a sort, practices of witchcraft. 11. The testimony of some wizard, though offering to show the witch's face in a glass, this, I grant, may be a good presumption to cause a straight examination, but a sufficient proof of conviction it cannot be. If the devil tell the grand jury that the person in question is a witch, and offers withal to confirm the same by oath, should the inquest receive his oath or accusation to condemn the man? Assuredly no. And yet, that is as much as the testimony of another wizard, who only by the devil's help reveals the witch. 12. If a man, being dangerously sick and like to die upon suspicion, will take it on his death that such a one hath bewitched him, it is an allegation of the same nature, which may move the judge to examine the party, but it is of no moment for conviction. 13. Among the sufficient means of conviction, the first is the free and voluntary confession of the crime made by the party suspected and accused after examination. I say not that a bare confession is sufficient, but a confession after due examination, taken upon pregnant presumptions. What needs now more witness or further inquiry? 14. There is a second sufficient conviction by the testimony of two witnesses of good and honest report, avouching before the magistrate upon their own knowledge these two things. Either that the party accused hath made a league with the devil, or hath done some known practice of witchcraft, and all arguments that do necessarily prove either of these being brought by two sufficient witnesses, are of force fully to convince the party suspected. 15. If it can be proved that the party suspected hath called upon the devil, or desired his help, this is a pregnant proof of a league formerly made between them. 16. If it can be proved that the party hath entertained a familiar spirit, and had conference with it, in the likeness of some visible creatures, here is evidence of witchcraft. 17. If the witnesses affirm upon oath that the suspected person hath done any action or work which necessarily infers a covenant made, as that he hath used enchantments, divined things before they come to pass, and that peremptorily raised tempests caused the form of a dead man to appear, it proveth sufficiently that he or she is a witch. This is the substance of Mr. Perkins. And I think that's more than enough of the wonders of the invisible world, being an account of the trials of several witches lately executed in New England, to which is added a farther account of the trials of the New England witches, by Cotton Mather and Increase Mather. That was really something, and we haven't even gotten to the trials. Hopefully, you're no longer awake to hear this, but if you are, and you want to read this work for yourself, 
You'll find a link to a free ebook version from Project Gutenberg in the show description. The description also includes a link to our Patreon page, where you can find out about exclusive perks available to supporters, including monthly episodes found nowhere else. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at Boring Books Pod. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night.